so there'd be freezing cold water and she would lay us down in the bath so she would hold you down under the water and of course you you hold a mouthful of air and she would hold us down to the point where we had to release that air and you see the bubbles go up um, and then you swallow water and it was only when we got to that point where you're basically drowning she'd maybe hold us for 10 seconds more and then pull us up. So I, I was born in the lovely town of Cheltenham um, and my parents, they both had substance abuse issues so my early years weren't the best but you know, they did try. My earliest memories are in a house with no carpets, uh, looking for food with my sister. How old were you at this point? I, I would have been not much more than three years old, um, just over three years old. At this point, my dad was really struggling to take care of us at all, um, along with his heroin issues. They started looking for private fostering arrangements and they heard of Eunice Spry. She was kind of like a bit of a hero in the local community and was well regarded. She'd already adopted a child. Um, you know, she was always trying to look out for other children. And I don't know who made contact with who, but um, she had like a half an hour conversation with my mum. And next thing I know, we are packing our bags and getting into the yellow Volvo and moving to Chooksbury. Do you remember much of that experience? So I, I've, like weirdly, I'd, I'd been only coming up for four years old, but I can remember everything of that day. We drove through the countryside to Chooksbury and we arrive at, you know, we would lived in quite a derelict house before this. So to arrive at this really quite nice big four bedroom house uh, in a quite, not well to do, but a quite nice neighborhood. I remember walking through the house, there was a playroom uh, just filled with toys. Uh, there was a garden filled with like you know, sand pits and water tables and stuff. And it, it, it was amazing. Uh, I remember her having to pretty much drag me in that first night because I, I was just playing in the sand pit. And like those first memories were really good for me. And who else was living in the household? Yeah, my sister moved in with me. Um, there was a Victoria or Tori, as she was called back then. And there was uh, a girl called Charlotte, who was adopted by Eunice. Victoria was also adopted by Eunice. And there were uh, Eunice's real daughter, Judith, who was part-time living in the house. And of course, Eunice. And what was your initial impression of Eunice? Being a Jehovah's Witness, she was always quite strict. Every Sunday we'd go to church for two hours. Um, Thursday evenings there was uh, you know, a church session where uh, we probably an hour in church in the Thursday evening and then you'd have Bible studies and then you'd also have Bible club. You know straight away there was it, it, it was quite evident she thought we were sinning all the time. She would be quoting scriptures to try and point out everything we were doing was a sin. So, yeah, it got quite, kind of messed up really quickly. And what was that, I suppose, turning point in her treatment of you? We were all called up to Charlotte's bedroom, which was the nicest bedroom in the house. And Eunice had found out some chocolate had gone missing in the house. And she was determined it was one of us three. Uh, so myself, Victoria, or Loma. So she asked us to all stand in a semicircle and asked us one at a time, did we take the chocolate? I said no. Um, Loma said no. Victoria said no. And she was right up in our face while asking this. It, it was weird. I, I made the mistake of laughing because it, it was a very weird situation. You know, I'd, I'd have been five years old at this point, five or six. 
she then walked over to the corner of the room and picked up a an old gnarly chair leg and then she took the stick and smashed it across the tops of our feet now this is probably the first time i've ever felt real pain like real 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 pain and straight away i, I collapsed on the floor and my sister did the same. Only Victoria managed to stand up to it, actually, which really pissed Eunice off. And the next round, so she did it all once on our feet. The next round was way harder because Victoria had managed to stand up. But yeah, that, that was the first crossing the line incident. Probably within the course of a month, we went from having very basic Jehovah's Witness style discipline to torture very quickly and you know this torture ranged from being forced to stay up all night being you know not allowed to sleep um she wasn't really starving us so much back then but very bland food not being allowed to eat what she was eating or charlotte was eating um daily beatings and forcing us to tell on each other if one of us fell asleep, we would have to wake Eunice up and she would punish us or we'd keep a tally and she would punish us the next morning or walking up and down stairs for hours on end, you know, kind of messed up stuff. And were you all um, experiencing these punishments and tortures? Charlotte was never abused or not that I know of, but she lived a very luxury life in com compared to ours. And my little brother Caleb wasn't abused. Um, now Caleb, Caleb's a weird one because um, he was had from birth, as was Charlotte. Caleb was treated so differently. Like Caleb was never really allowed to grow up. He had this dream life. He was getting fed. He was getting to play in the sandpit. You know, that was my sandpit. You know, he was doing everything I wanted to while we were working a farm, and barely struggling, you know, barely staying alive. If she was beating you and you would have been sustaining physical injuries, are you still going to church? Were you going to school? We went to school and Aloma got caught stealing food because she was hungry. So that raised alarm bells. I went to school and Eunice had kicked me downstairs. We were starting, especially when we moved to the farmhouse later on, we were starting to sustain quite nasty injuries. So I, I had bruises all down the one side of my body. And of course, school picked up on this straight away. That scared Eunice straight away. And we were all pulled out of school within weeks of each other and home educated. And you mentioned the farmhouse. So at what point did you move there and where was the farm? So we moved there, I think around 96. Uh, an old guy called John, John Drake. Uh, owned it and Eunice befriended him um, and decided to move us all in so she could take care of him. Uh, Eunice had never met this bloke before um, but I think she saw gold signs. He was in very bad health, was having to go on oxygen etc and he, he died semi-suspiciously because he'd been in quite he was in bad health but um He'd somehow turned his oxygen off in the evening, so he didn't get oxygen while he was sleeping. And I think everyone around him found that a bit weird, to be honest. Eunice had decided that we should all go visit John's body. So we all paraded around John, who was just led there dead. <laughs> to be shown that at six years old is, is horrible. Yeah, you know, she liked to see us scared. That, 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 that was evident. So I, I think she must have got something out of that because yeah, why would you parade children around a, a dead body? It's just it's just weird. Like she must have got something out of it. It, it just it's just weird that his will changed a couple of days before he died and left everything to Charlotte. Um so suddenly Eunice is in charge of this farmhouse as she is Charlotte's mum and all the land and all the money that went with it it's just 
just a bit weird in my book. Do you think that Eunice might have? Oh, I 100% think she did. 100%. And I don't think I'm the only one. Once we'd moved to the farmhouse and John had passed, um, she basically had an open canvas to abuse us. There was no one around. We didn't have daily visitors. Um, there were houses in the area, but they were far enough not to be an issue. Aloma and Victoria, you know, we had a very weird bond. We genuinely kept each other alive from nursing each other's injuries um, to, you know, stealing food to keep each other alive. Yeah, we had a bond that was way more than sibling. Burns were some of the bad things. Uh, Eunice had this thing where she'd like to get our hand and quickly touch it on top of a, they're like a fire coal driven oven and it would have this steel paint on top where which would get hot because there's a flame underneath it and she never we never knew when it was going to happen but quite often it would be random she would just grab your hand and force it down so one of us would come in with one of these injuries and we would try and wrap it and keep it clean and some of the worst things get you know getting hit around the back of the head with an iron bar and blacking out and coming round, you know, minutes later. It was like being in, at war and trying to keep each other going and like, you know, doing life-saving care, you know, all while still trying to run a farm and be kids. I know that she um, did horrendous things. She like fed you washing up liquid and that there were the washing up liquid thing was um, she was cleaning our mouths of lies. It's really hard not to be sick, and then if we were sick, we would have to eat that sick up. So the we couldn't be sick. You had to keep it down, but you know you're gagging continuously. Um, in those early years, we, probably, you know, we were taking a beating a day, a, a minimum. But then she almost started to run out of excuses to punish us. So that's when the starving started. Um, we were given very little food. Any food we did eat would either be stolen or would be foraged basically we, there were potato patches on the farm and apple trees and stuff and we, we lived off the land for most of those uh, later years and she very quickly realized we couldn't be surviving on the food she was giving us so thus started a vicious circle where she'd accuse us of stealing we were but <laughs> and the punishment cycle kept going on so she would start using bamboo canes on the feet. They really f hurt. They really hurt. It's like a cane almost across the feet. We would scream when that happens. So she would shove sticks down our throat. Some of the hardest times were the winters, the early winters, because we weren't allowed to live in the main farmhouse. And it was in a horrific state. There was no electric, there was no heating. There was, you know, um, it dripped. Uh, there were rats in it. But those winters were hard, staying warm, keeping each other alive. I remember one day going into Victoria and her being so cold, I couldn't wake her. And eventually I'm like shaking her, Victoria, I wake up. And eventually she woke up and I genuinely thought she was dying. <laughs> uh, you know, we were so malnourished and so not well. Up in the bathroom within the farmhouse, there was this cast iron roll top bath and um, she would fill this with freezing cold water. And she would lay us down in the bath and the first thing that hits you is freezing cold. So you almost fight that straight away. So she would hold you down under the water. And of course, you, you hold a mouthful of air. And 
she would hold us down to the point where we had to release that air. And you see the bubbles go up. Um, and then you swallow water. And it was only when we got to that point where you're basically drowning, she'd maybe hold us for 10 seconds more and then pull us up. And I often think back and it was only luck that probably meant that one of us didn't die. Did you like experience joy, experience happiness as a kid at all? Yeah, you know, as humans, we, we always somehow managed to find the best scenario. Um, and we lived in this beautiful area that the summers were incredible. You would lie in the fields and there'd be deer running through the grass and you would just sit back and watch them. I would go down and um, yeah, dab on my feet in the river um, in the morning, at five in the morning, the sun just rising. And some of, you know, there were some amazing memories. You know, we, ha we had this amazing holiday in Florida uh, that came out of nowhere. So we, we were being heavily abused. This is just after all the starving going on. We were really in a bad state. And then one day, Unison announces, we're all going to Florida. And we were all uh, bought clothes, suitcases. We all roll up at the airport. We fly business class to Orlando. Like, we rolled into Florida and she was being loving. You know, we landed at the airport. We drive through uh, Orlando along, I think it's Highway 41, and there's all these hotels and like theme parks as you go along and water parks and bungee jumps. And I'm a kid from the country. I've never seen any of this. Like, this was amazing. And we arrive at this villa and there's a swimming pool and cupboards full of food. And she puts us to bed, gives us a kiss on the cheek. We wake up the next morning, I'm expecting our daily punishment. No, we're, we're given breakfast. We're given actual food. And we go to Disneyland. We go to Cape Canaveral. I swam with dolphins and stingrays. And we had a, the best holiday in the world. And no abuse. And when you were in Florida, did you feel like you loved her? 100%. Yeah, 100%. Um, she was my mum. She, you know, she'd give us a cuddle each morning. She was feeding us. She was taking us to these amazing things. Um, I want to think that maybe she was really loving us at the time. But how can you flick a switch that easily? I don't know. I, yeah, I've got my personal thoughts. I, I think we were sexually abused in America. That is, that is my thought because there are evenings I can't remember at all. We were in this nice villa. There'd be lots of visitors. And I, I can't remember most of that. And it's only as an adult now when I try and piece together the pieces. I'm like, this, that something didn't something wasn't right out there also how do you fly all those kids across the world you know she has no job that's that's a lot of money i think there is a reason we were out there but i don't know i have no proof of that and that's just my thought what happened when you got back so again amazing flight home and we arrive home and we open the door and there's steam in the house. And turns out someone had left the immersion heater on, which is like a big water tank and it uh, bores water. She flew into an instant rage. And within hours of being home, I'd had my first beating. And emotionally, having had no 
abuse for you know six seven weeks and thinking actually we finally made it you know we finally became the good children that she always wanted you know to suddenly come back to the abuse was very very hard to deal with and I remember going to bed that night questioning everything So I, I was living with Eunice's parents at this time. Um, both were very elderly. So I became their living carer, basically. And it was only five minutes walk away from our Chooksbury house. But in that time, I didn't see Victoria at all. I didn't see, I saw Caleb very briefly. Our lives had kind of separated a bit. But what I didn't realise was going on that... Um, Victoria had been going to church again and a few of the Jehovah's Witnesses broke rank and decided to ask her about the scars. And we, we were littered in scars. But hers, she was very pale complexion, so hers were quite obvious. And they broke rank and decided to ask her and like, say, you know, you've got to tell us. Now, initially, she stopped. She didn't want to tell them. But eventually, they kept asking and she broke down and told them our story. And then two days later, the, the police raid happened. 6 a.m. on the dot, I'm on the mattress on the floor. So it's only a one bedroom bungalow. And there's a massive knock on the door. And there, I scurry on out to the door. I open the door sleepily and there's a policeman and he just says, your mother has been arrested you need to come with us. We'd always been told that when Armageddon comes, like the governments and the police will be involved and stuff. So we went in to protect mum mode. And I basically gave an amazing story of how amazing our childhood was. And, you know, no, she's never, she smacks us once in a while, but, you know, oh, oh yeah, we have the best food in the world. And... For an hour and a half, I just sat there and basically lied to them and said everything was fine. But it didn't feel like I was lying. It felt like I was protecting um, our family and Jehovah. It just felt right at the time. So the police decided that they'd end the interview there. And I was, what I didn't realise is some phone calls were being made in the background and they decided to take me to go and see Victoria. Now, I hadn't seen Victoria in over nine months. And she was in hospital, but she was paralysed. Um, so I'm expecting to see Victoria in a wheelchair or on her bed, etc. I walk into this hospital room and Victoria gets off the bed and walks to me. At that point, my life changed forever. And it turns out all these years, Eunice had been denying her physical health care in the hope that compensation would be reached. So Victoria wasn't ever allowed to get the care she needed to help her walk. So she looked paralyzed. I steamed out of that room smashing through corridors just I wanted to get away I was in full flight mode that was the start of my new life that point there that was the first realization that actually everything had been a lie how many years at this point had you been in Eunice's care so I was 16 years old when the police raided and uh, I'd been in Eunice's care for uh, 13 of those years I was at work when she was found guilty. BBC News flashed up and this, this lady's been found guilty. I was in the break room and I remember this lady across the way went, thank f she, you know, she was horrible. She's going to get what she deserves. I, I remember thinking, 
uh, one wanting def to defend her for a second and go, Adrian, wait, 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 that's my mum you're talking about. And then actually just sat in back and going, actually, yeah, she was horrible. And I think that was the start of me starting to rebuild and get over Eunice Spry. She got sentenced to 14 years, which at the time was the largest, I think it still is one of the largest child abuse sentences. Uh, the judge said he couldn't give more. So she got sentenced to 14 years. Um, that was reduced to 12 on appeal. And then she served half. So I think it was seven years in total. Just sounds so minimal for all that she put you and your siblings through. It's quite hard on the victims, I think, to try and deal with the fact that their lives have been ruined. You know, our, the thing is, she got seven years in total. But for us, it's a much longer sentence to have to deal with the physical side. You know, I live in hospitals trying to fix some of the stuff internally and externally, what's happened. So my sentence keeps going, even though she's now living a wonderful life, fully paid for by my taxes, and gets another shot at life. And actually, we're left to deal with our injuries. I know that your sister, Victoria, she took her own life. It took a day for me for, for it to hit me, and then it hit me hard. And it was, it's been one of the hardest things to get over that I've had to deal with. Um, I've dealt with a lot of trauma and a lot of things in my life, but to try and get over her death, yeah, it's very hard to deal with. Very hard to deal with. For any victim of abuse, whether it's an abusive relationship, an abusive parent, do you have any advice? My advice, my main advice would always be to talk. Um, the worst thing you can do is try and hide this and hold it um, inside of you. Any abuse is wrong. It doesn't matter that years have passed, etc. Any abuse is wrong and you deserve a chance to make that right. You know, th there's always that thought that maybe because of my abuse, I'm not worthy to have a child. So that actually put me off having kids for years. I, I'm very lucky to be a dad. Uh, I have an amazing little two-year-old boy. He's the best thing that's ever happened to me. Um, he's incredible. They, and how someone can harm a kid, ah, I, don't, I don't know. He, he's my world. If you could say something to that little boy version of yourself all those years ago, what would you say to him? Just because you're not feeling love now doesn't mean love doesn't exist. And love is a hard thing to describe, but once you've felt it, 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 it's an amazing feeling. Even though that light is very dim, there is still a light at the end of the tunnel. He got so confident with the abuse. I would be invited to his house and so would another boy. Abuse one, turn over and abuse the other. And that's how confident he was in being able to abuse young boys, still knowing that even though somebody was present in the room, that they wouldn't say anything. 